presenter with us, Zig Vanek. And the way I ended up meeting him is I ended up going down to the Titusville Men's Garden Club because I wanted to check out they were doing their annual, you know, plant sales, tree sales. When I was there, I was absolutely amazed with how much, and the biggest thing was probably, that I was amazed with how much he knew. So he could look at a leaf and be like, yeah, that's broccoli, or, and was even telling the person the variety of the broccoli and everything like that. So I thought, you know what, he would be a great person to have. And then he also had a really good backstory, which I'll let him tell kind of his background and everything else like that. But, um, but yeah, I thought it was nice to get somebody fresh in here and somebody who could also maybe get us more connected with our community too as far as what they're doing at the men's club. And um, I will let you pick up, oh, and I also just want to let everybody know we have Peggy Green here tonight once again. She's our secretary. We have Kendall Cliff here, who's our veterans liaison. And um, you guys know Chris, who's out on a meeting call in the truck, who is our grant writer. So I just wanted to make sure you guys knew there is, you know, lots of people here tonight if you have any questions about our organization. And I also have cards back there. And yeah, here's it. Vic, It's all in the center, and we can do everything out of the water as far as the sports and stuff that we can grow 
itself tastes incredible. I've been playing around with different, I have a labor experience, so I've been playing with different varieties and how to grow things and one little side dude, you know, I found out that you can grow at least most everything is in a container. So I didn't have a place where we can grow it in the ground, so I put things in a container, in a hanging basket and a flat or in a hot. And so one of the side notes that I was always experimenting with is I find places, I'm some carrots. I said, I said grow, grow some carrots. Well, I thought this would be pretty easy. Well, I had some carrots on the ground and um, most of the crop was no good at all. But I did have about 30, 30 pots or so of carrots in a, in a five gallon pot. And so they had lots of room to grow. And those, and those were wonderful carrots. They had they were nice and long. And so we ended up, carrots ended up being one of our major crops. We ended up growing um, about 500 five gallon pots of carrots a year. And we ended up with about uh, 1,200, 1,400 pounds of carrots a year. That was the uh, garden center. And we sold. We sold, gosh, we'd go out and pull them right out of the pots and have fresh carrots all the way through December, January, February. So, anyhow, um, so anyhow, when we left, we sold our business a couple years ago and moved to Florida. And like probably a lot of people, I think my dad moved to Florida because our, our son lives down here and works in the space coast. Um, he used to be in the greenhouse business, but he decided he liked computers better. And now he's, you know, he's definitely involved in all kinds of computer stuff. That I, that so, anyhow, that's a little bit about me. Um, hopefully we can help you have a few tricks and tips to help you out with your vegetable garden. Um, so, um, of course, one of the first things you need to know when you, when you start out is are you going to grow in the ground? Most people do. Or are you going to grow in a container? Or the other thing that people do is they get older, you don't want to grow as much, so lots of people want to raise beds. And so raise beds are a neat way to grow things also. And if you grow a tremendous amount of things, if you have enough soil bought, then you're going to raise um, but it's nice if you don't have the, you don't have, have like, you know, the small animals jumping up in there, you don't have to bend over as much, and uh, so you don't have to as many weeds. So, um, anyhow, so, where, you know, lots of people already know where you can get seeds at. I'm not telling you anything new, uh, but you can get seed catalogs are a great place. Um, lots of seed exchanges out there. Okay, so, lots of times, if you, if you happen to collect your own seeds, and you know what kind they are, or whatever, you can change them to lots of other people for lots of them. You can see these changes around um, that goes. Um, you can go to garden centers or other, other um, big stores and get uh, box stores and get your, get your seed just about anywhere. Um, but one thing lots of people don't know about seeds is how to keep them viable. You know, you can go, um, you can go in the Mesa Verde area out in Colorado where they found corn and things like that that are hundreds of years old that are still viable and things like that. But that's not the most some, some seeds will go downhill uh, in this one season. But there is a way that you can go along from that, and that is by keeping things usually refrigerated and sometimes usually at least refrigerated in an airtight container. Um, and that would usually really lengthen the amount of time that you can hold your seeds. So um, lots of people for years and years, and lots of people that just throw in a corner, lots of them in the shed, or in the greenhouse, or whatever. And um, they, some things will last, but there are other things that will go downhill. And even if you don't, you know, they, they're not all going to die at once. But say you, you've got a pack of seeds that you think has got maybe you know, 78 or 90 percent germination. And say it's got 90 percent germination over a period of years. That germination dies off and seeds become much, much viable. And sometimes you can turn to 60 or 50 or 40 percent, or sometimes and, and spinach doesn't last long at all. If you keep spinach warm, if you have spinach in a pack, if you don't use it up in a year, it gives you over 10 or 15, 20 percent germination usually in your variety. So you keep the, you can keep your things refrigerated on the corner of the refrigerator that works. It goes well for keeping the seeds viable. Um, okay, so you know, when, when you're going to plant, well, I have, I have spring and fall and winter in there. The reason you don't see summer there is because most of the time everybody knows it's a little too hot. But people wear plants to be outside and in the middle of summer time, so they take off these things. Um, don't, most people don't plant a whole lot of things in from the middle of June to the middle of September. September. Um, there are there's a few exceptions in general. Um, plants can survive the end of June and July, but there's in between plants thriving and plants surviving. Okay, so plants that thrive do not just survive. And so, it gets pretty hot, just for instance, tomatoes are only about 90 degrees. Basically, tomatoes will start shutting down and not building more. 
way to get new oxygen to it, it's like that, it really does not need to cook. You can take, you can take compost up, naturally, compost will cook about 135 to 140 degrees naturally before this kind of stops. And you say, well, doesn't that kill what's supposed? This that one is supposed to kill your seed, your weed seeds. Okay, but don't kill any of the weed actually. Soils out there, like I said, um, there's um, you go to any, any store just about and find people's favorite. Um, my favorite um, potting soil, which I use, which is, which is peat light mix, which was a com combination of peat moss, perlite, potting stone, and yucca. And that's just an organic um, growing mix. And I use that because I'm certified organic for growing um, vegetables. And um, the yucca is a wetting agent, it keeps peat moss. Going out and not, um, not even really going for that. Peat moss is just that. Regular peat moss dry out. It's, you put it in a bucket, you put it in a, in a wheelbarrow and dump it in there and it just floats. It takes forever to get that again. So, um, so anyhow. Excuse me, sir. Why did you say the name of this? Excuse me, name of what? Uh, the, the, soil soil the soil that I like, the soil that I like, you probably will never see around here is Berger, P E R G E R. Um, it's Berger. Um, I can get it. Um, the supplier that I used to use in Colorado does have it over in Orlando wholesale. That, that's, that particular variety is not produced for retail um, buyer. So do you, you have an alternative then? Yes, I say the alternative that I've used before, which is really good, is fertile bone. Um, so fertile bone comes in a uh, uh, red, black, and white bag. Um, it's a fairly fine grind. Um, fertile bone has got a great, got a great name. Um, we use a lot of their products to private labels, so you're not going to find it in box stores. So you're going to have to go to a garden center in order to find it. It is not organic, not certified organic because it's, um, it's not Omri rated. You know, anybody wants to know about Omri? Omri is, you have to be really careful with Omri. Omri is most, 90% of the time, it's great and it's certified and you can believe it. But there's some things that Omri does that I don't agree with is they're, is they're not organic products and they're not organic. Anyhow, so, can we purchase that? You, here? you can get you can get, yeah. you can get um, yeah. one at um, Down the Rock, which is nice. Okay, that's the Rock Ledge. You know, I said there are people that used to come to Rock Ledge, um, that many trees out there, you know, years and years and years. Um, and so, um, they sold their gardens in about three months, and I sold my gardens out there. But yeah, they have, they have a great couple of people that are running it right now. Um, things are very much the same as they were before. They still have that particular mix. Other, other good mixes out there. There's, there's Schultz, there's Lambert, um, there's lots of good, but I know a lot of other things you get what you pay for. You get the cheapest stuff, you're going to get the, the demo for stuff. And people are like, I need mean, somebody, I, I just put up, somebody's got to ask, what about Miracle Girl? And I would say, Miracle Girl is probably the worst stuff in the world as far as the pie side. I know a lot of garden growers across the country, across the world. There's not one grower that I know that uses miracle for with the cotton soil. Usually because it's inconsistent, it's full of heavy metals, it's not organic, um, it's, it's just not a good cotton soil. As a matter of fact, I used to do comparison planting between the soil that we used to grow in and their stuff, and I used to have customers accuse me all the time as if it's cheap soil. And what's wrong with the tomato plants? You sold them. I don't know. But the cat was wrong. Got them for 10 days and now they're dying. I think, well, ours aren't dying. I said, what kind of soil do you put them in? Well, I'm putting a miracle bill. And so, you know, it ends up having a problem with lots of, not that every time that you'll have problems, but you will have a high probability of having problems. And there's lots of other good stuff out there. I don't usually like to bash any one thing or the fertilizer is fine. But their problems are going to be Lots of other ones out there. It's a Lambert, and Fertilone, and Black Gold, and um, Stipsoma. Uh, lots of them good. Yeah, I've been buying Black Gold. I'm kind of a soil snob. I come from Southern Oregon, Northern California, where the soil is amazing. It's we have all these good, good, yes, great. right, you know, the industry out there. So the soil is so nice. So yeah, is that your best organic recommendation then, the Black Gold? It's probably.
there's a bag. No, but there's a Molybdenum. 
okay, there's, a, there's something they used to strengthen steel in um, Colorado. There's the biggest, mine, the biggest aluminum mine in the world is in Colorado. And it, you have to have an extremely minute amount of it. That, you know, for point seconds, for instance, if you don't have aluminum in your soil, they very through it all. It's awesome that you brought that up because also in apple trees, that's huge, that apple boron. But I'm not trying to sell you know, a crop. I, mean, I use the organic sphere and then the one that's um, the NutriPlant. That has got a lot of those macro micronutrients. There's a lot of them out there. And some of them are fairly, you know, aluminum is a fade out the bottom, but there's a lot of other ones which are very important. Mm -hmm. right? like calcium, sulfur, manganese, magnesium, uh, copper, boron, there's lots of them, and all of them work at different plants in different ways. Zinc um, is a very important one for lots of nut farmers. Um, things like that, you know, zinc and cotton and things like that. So um, there's lots of, there are lots of, there are lots of, of uh, things you don't hear about, so I'm sure. And actually, you can get them, um, everybody talks about, in this area, you talk about STEM, and everybody thinks of what? Science, math, and, and right? Actually, in our, in our industry, STEM means a different thing. It means soluble trace element mix. Okay, so um, soluble trace element mix is what they use when you're trying to get all of those elements on, and you're trying to, to, to push up something where you might have some deficiencies. And of course, you don't want to have the toxicity either, because if you go too far the other way, then you have toxicity. Not the, you know, but for foliar feeds, that's usually a good way to trick the plant to open up its pores mm -hmm. and in those that you're talking about. Yeah. And I know um, also down at Rockwood Gardens, there's somebody out in Merritt Island or whatever who made this that will open up those pores as well. Mm -hmm. So have you heard about that? There's different things, but actually, um, your, your, your pores and your plants are open usually during the day. Okay, they can be in carbon dioxide. Uh, they can help oxygen. Like, so when the, the stomas are open, okay, um, that's when you usually fold your feed. Okay, and you can't really, usually you fold your feed, and it doesn't work well. Okay, um, but during, during the day is fine. Um, even blue spruces, spruces, spruce trees, lots of things can take in, can take in. A reasonable amount of fertilizer um, by foliar application. And so we're doing. And also um, for that foliar feeding that we're talking about, we open up. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure we're not going to be dry spells that they get. Mm -hmm. Like if we usually do it like before it rains or if you have a watering system, a microbial system, mm -hmm. then it's fine. But otherwise, when it opens, it's supposed to also, if you don't have that water there, Salt. Dry the tree out. Yes, you can get the same burn we talked about with fertilizer burn because it's got salt. The water evaporates and when you dump it up, you've got at that point concentrated fertilizer or salt sitting on your plant. You can burn it. Yeah, yeah that, that's definitely the thing we're going to talk about a little bit more about that when we get down to the, uh, to the, to the uh, diseases and things like that. We're just talking about spraying. And then we run into the same problems we talk about spraying things. So, um, of mm course, -hmm. you get into, we talk, touch a little bit on organic fertilizers, and um, fertilizers that are organic in general have a lower kick to them, if you will, a kick of being NPEK. It's usually a lot lower because it's, it's not charged with chemicals, and you can buy a, for instance, a lawn fertilizer, you can buy something that's 40% nitrogen, okay, and it's, it's got half of it, each half of it is slow release, and um, it will release over a period of time because it has different nights nitrates and so uh, you might have calcium nitrate or ammonium nitrate or you might have water insoluble nitrogen and there are different nitrogens that it can have so it makes it uh, slow, slow release. So you can have 40%, you can put it on your lawn according to directions and it will not burn. It releases slowly over a period of time. If you put 40% nitrogen out the miracle for a while, when you're you're gonna have almost uh, within a couple of days you're gonna have some severe problems. What kind of fertilizer? You're, usually your your nitrogen when your when your organic things are usually down at one to four, sometimes five to six percent um, nitrogen, uh, but not usually too much more than that. As opposed to your your uh, non-organic fertilizers, which are and there's I think there's a sometimes there's a place for both of them. I don't think we ever be 
you know, doing what we do in agriculture across this country to get them for things that were unorganic. So there's, there's, a, there's a weird, you know, when I'm going to eat my food out of my garden, I like things that are non-organic. But I don't, I'm not bashing people who don't eat things that are organic. There's a lot of other people out there in this country who do many, many hundreds of thousands of acres of fertilizing with, with uh, non non
not tell this one, you find out with Oakley, why Oakley, if we didn't get in with a wheat cracker, we're going to be fine, why call up and use those as a top dress to help each of the weeks. So there's lots of different tips, tips and tricks you can use to do things um, to keep the weeds down. So. What if weeds uh, um, that you use the lawnmower to But the thing you have to remember is that it's probably going to get some weed seeds in there. So, you know, unless you have a really nice lawn that has, you know, what kind of lawn you have when you have the hay. The, 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 the leaves, the trees that we break down and stuff? No, there's, 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 there's no weed seeds in there. Oh, okay. So we probably going to have some, just because. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
grasshoppers, thank you. And you see the baby black ones. It's uh, like still them before they grow. Uh, unfortunately, um, there was a actually there was a place about 15, about 30 or 40 miles from where I used to live that used to make a wonderful organic um, brand plate that we used to use um, that we used to that we used to, uh, to use to kill to kill um, grasshoppers. Unfortunately, about four years ago, their place burned to the ground, and nobody ever come back to anything better um, to kill to kill you know, organic plates to kill grasshoppers. You seven one grasshoppers when they're small. When grasshoppers get big, seven doesn't touch them. It's just take one more step. And whether it's five percent or ten percent, seven part carbo, that's carbo the same thing as seven. Did I hear you I mean did, did I hear you say that there's something better than BT? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's called spin uh, it, not, lots of different brand names, but it's called spinosad or spinosad. Oh. Uh, you know, that is a wonderful product. It's, it's it was found in an old rum factory in Puerto Rico about four about four years ago. Um, comes in Boston, who is probably, probably the most recognizable name is Captain Jack. So, so Captain Jack? Captain Jack. It was a name that you'll find later. But just like when you eat food, and you look at the label to see it, make sure that you, Captain Jack has other things under its brand name. So make sure you're buying Spinosad first. How do you spell it? Yeah, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D. And Home Depot has Captain Jack. No, no. And, and, that's, and that does two things. That does a great, that's a couple of things. It does great, first of all, I think it's easier than BT because usually I, I can spray I can spray Captain Jack on a caterpillar and in three hours it's dead. Three hours. Go on. And hundreds of them. I mean I have a massive that one. And you spray it and you're the hole in the ground dead. So they stop eating. And and the good news about Captain Jack is well it all goes kills thrips. And we were used to what's the flower thrips out in color. I don't care how long the children from the But once again, it's a great thing for killing thrips and it's organic. They also have, they found some some good things as far as some action on aphids. It'll, if you read it, it'll tell you it kills lots of different things. I, I still maintain the two best things that it killed are any kind of caterpillar and thrips. And the best two. Now, when you, when you spray thrips, if anybody's gotten into it, thrips are they're very, very, very tiny little insects. They do a lot of damage, and they do it very quickly. If you're going to they do your root, if you have roses or anything like that, thrips love roses, even though they're flower thrips, they, you know, they suck the foliage, they, they, they come everything. The best thing that they're doing is until they a tight flower like a rose. When you spill, if you spray tap injects, take a little bit of table sugar, mix it in your spray, okay? And they, and they have uh, all the fruits have a, have a sweet tooth. So they cannot make the sugar, they tap injects. I, I have um, nothing for my and I have faith this one. I've gone out to shoes. The only thing I can say is that um, which is the problem with it, you don't want to do it if you're just with your sources or with or platforms on it. No, yeah, but you can spray with me, which is organic, but you gotta be careful with me. You should do it in the morning or the evening. Not bring the hot part of the day to any oils. And then we talked about this in the when they're open when they'll be at the breathing holes that they have in all your leaves. And those are open when you spray during the day. The oil, anything with it's an oil, whether it's a, a dormant oil, anything that's an oil, oil based, it can burn the plants. They do it early in the morning or right before dark. It can be a big problem. But so neem, neem is the only thing that I know that you can spray when your neem leaves go over. You can use dish soap. You know, people say dish soap, some people say pyrethrins, and some pyrethrins work sometimes for some people, but not always. How much dietomaceous earth? What? How much dietomaceous earth? Dietomaceous earth is great for things that crawl yes. on the ground, like snails and slugs and things like that. But if you cover it up in your trees, well, if, you're, if you can do that, you're basically like diatom, dietomaceous earth, or diatom, the greatest for little animals that. When they die, they leave well, sharp shells. Yeah. That's what that's what slices up the breast blood or a snail crawls across it. It gets sliced up and they bleed to death. So if you can you can get something that crawls across the actual diatom, it'll work. That's you know sometimes if it works, hey, if it works and you have success with it, you're not going to fight success. If it works, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's not, it's not.
to make a decision when you're doing that, how much, first of all, how much how deep is your pocketbook? You want to get all the weeds off? You want to have it come in and have it resodded? You just want to put a weed in on it? If you do a weed in, you can do a good job on it. You know, lots of different weeds feeds. Once again, read the directions. Some weed and feeds must be wet when you apply them in order for the weed to to work, or else you just fertilize all the weeds. So you've got to be careful and, and know what you're doing. You read the, read the label and know what you're doing when you put a weed and feed in on the first a weed, a feed part, you can't do it. It's got, it's got nitrogen in it, which most of them have some nitrogen in it, and they have definitely has phosphorus, which is a big no no between the first of first of June and the first of October. So you gotta be careful when you do it, but there, there's a different ways to do it, but you have to decide, hey, is my is my grass 70% gone and I've got you know 70 percent weeds now? And when you draw the line and how much of that, then you're gonna have to reseed because if the weeds are dead and all you have is spray on here, so you're gonna have to reseed. When it's you know, a lot of the gas, you have a lot of the moisture from the Uh, common than fungi. 
Um, unfortunately, viruses are fairly prevalent, especially when tomatoes. So, um, especially with tomatoes and peppers, there's some other things that you can get viruses on also. But since so many people grow so many peppers and tomatoes, that's one of the things that, um, one of the biggest things I can tell you, um, when I went to, in, in the medical room, I did not urge you, I could not, I could legally not hire anybody that smoked because of tobacco mosaic virus. Okay, with tobacco mosaic virus, um, first of all, um, it's very, it's when people that smoke, it's on their fingers, and you touch anything that's related to tobacco, or any, and guess what? Petunias, every petunia that's related to tobacco gets the virus like that. Um, all the share marks that you people might have bought a couple weeks ago, on our mobile you can get viruses like that. Uh, but tomatoes and peppers are very, very susceptible to it also. And so just by breaking any of the any of the hairs on the leaves or the stems, you can't get the virus just like that. Um, and you can literally lose a, a crop or at least a good part of the crop by viruses. And, and viruses are like the people, just like plant viruses. And once you get a virus, there is nothing, there's, there's nothing, there's no virus side. Once you get a once you get once your plant gets virus, you can throw it away. It will never, it'll never go at all. You'll see, I have seven plants here, and six of them are doing great, and one of them is really stunted and yellow and doesn't look right, and it's probably got a virus. Okay? Um, viruses happen. Um, they're not only transmitted by hand, they're transmitted, by, um, transmitted through nature also. But not, um, you can get about some, but usually it's a very small percentage. You should probably not. One or two percent, eight, eight percent, something like that. are a little bit more sensitive to getting viruses than a lot of them. Um, but there is no cure for viruses. So when we had, we had people that used to get viruses from their tomatoes in Colorado, and if you water and water runs downhill, then it would go right to the next tomato. So get rid of it as soon as you can, because if it runs or if you hit the, 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 the list, the stem cell list, it transmits and if any way, any mechanical way of any the virus can get there, you look at the soil, and yes, it works in the time. So if you get a virus, it has to do Patients that call like spot virus, there's lots of viruses out there. I'm just using one that most people are familiar with. So anything that smells or can, can be. It doesn't mean they are. It means they can be. Thank you. 
or something that I learned um, when I was working about my college and things like that, is how to terminate them. And parents will terminate much better. You have one or two ways to, to pre-terminate your parents before you plant them in the ground. Okay? And one way is by putting them in boiling water, and the other way is by freezing them for 10 days. So I used to mix them in, I tried both ways, and I think I have about five or eight percent better germination in the freezer than I did by boiling water on them. But you just mix them up a little bit of waste soil and get them from the waste and get that if you're trying to do the pre-germinating, a lot of pre-germinating, if you're just trying to get that seed coat soft, then you can get carrots. And you have to be careful. You can get coated carrots too. You have to be careful that you don't you know you can freeze them and just soak them uh, as coated coated seed that way. I used to take them up to the wall so many times to take them and put them in a little bit of soil and put them in the freezer and um, that, that moisture is enough to crack that seed coat so you plant them instead of carrots coming up over a period of 30 or 40 days. I think they come up over a period of about 7 to 10 days. Wow. Thank you for listening to me talk. <laughs>